Good morning, happy Friday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect as usual. Busy Friday, had some calls this morning, almost lost my voice at one point, that was kind of scary. Um, but let's go ahead and dig right into the Q&A so we can get this thing rolling. This comes from Austin. Austin is the current IFAST Physical Therapy Fellow. So he's an actual physical therapist, came in. He wants to utilize the model in his practice. And so he is, he is learning that. And he came up with a, with a pretty good question. Uh, we've kind of touched on it a little bit in the past, but I think it's worthy of, of going through it again because, again, some of this stuff can get really confusing at times <clears throat> when we're dealing with all this complexity. This has to do with the loss of hip internal rotation and, and why this would occur. So Austin says, if somebody has limited hip, <clears throat> excuse me, if someone has lim limited hip internal rotation, what would indicate the anterior, or that would indicate anterior compression. However, I have mentioned in the past that a loss of IR can be due to compression below the level of the trochanter posteriorly. How do you determine whether the compression is from the anterior or posterior aspect of the hip, limiting hip IR? So the first thing we want to do is we want to uh, establish a framework of, of how this internal and external rotation would, would occur. So we're going to look at the, the two uh, positions of the pelvis from an inhale and exhale standpoint. So as we inhale, we ER. As we exhale, we IR. And so as we move through hip range of motion, we need this relative motion in the pelvis to actually access full, full ranges of motion. So from this early phase of hip flexion as an example, we would be in this ER state, which would provide the external rotation through the hip. As we move through this middle range, we need to capture internal rotation. So we need to ca capture that exhaled position of the pelvis. And then at end range flexion again, to, to hit that sort of compressed hip flexion, we need to be able to recapture this externally rotated and, and inhaled position of the pelvis. So that's our standard that we're going to be working from. Now, typically we're going to be measuring internal and external rotation at this 90 degrees of, of hip flexion. So we have to be able to achieve that position alone just to get a normal measure. And so this is where, where some of this posterior stuff is going to come into play. So typically what we're going to see when we lose the internal rotation is we're gonna see this anterior aspect of the pelvis getting compressed. And so what that does is it actually changes the shape of, of an orientation of, of the pubis and ischium such that, that we lose that, that internal rotation. So let me give you an example. So if we have somebody that's biased towards an inhalation strategy, so somebody that's biased towards ER, um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna pick up more external rotation, you're gonna lose internal rotation. But if I have this full excursion of, of the 100 degrees of normal hip rotation, it means we still have some relative motion in, in the pelvis. Um, but we do have this shape change in the, in the ischium that creates the, the ER bias. And that's why we see the, the reduction of hip internal rotation under those circumstances. However, however, if we start to superimpose a superficial compressive strategy in this area of the musculature below the level of the trochanter. So this is more superficial. So the first loss of range of motion that we talked about was this deeper stuff, which is the, the typical, that they're referred to as external rotators of, of the hip. So we're talking about the, the Gemelli brothers um, and obturator uh, internus limiting that, that initial hip external rotation if we're biased towards inhalation. If we superimpose this, the, the superficial compressive strategy on top of this, now we have a situation where we're going to lose early external rotation. So this early phase of external rotation will now um, be limited by this, this superficial compressive strategy, which means that I can't even get my hip into this, this position where I would typically measure this, this uh, hip internal rotation. So the way that you're gonna distinguish this posterior compressive strategy from the typical anterior compressive strategy is the fact that you're gonna lose the ability to actually flex the hip even to, to this 90 degree angle. And so this is where you're gonna see the crazy limited straight leg raises. So you'll see like you know 35 to 45 degrees of a straight leg raise. 
where you're going to see hip flexion that looks like as you move it towards hip flexion, the pelvis is going to try to roll away from you because, again, I don't have the internal rotation available to me. I don't have the relative motion in the pelvis anymore that would allow me to go from this ER to IR to ER strategy. It is now locked into one piece. And so now as I try to flex the hip, I, I, the, the only relative motion I have is between the femur and the pelvis as a unit, so it starts to turn away, or, you, or you'll see it start to deviate outward to a degree before you get to the 90 degree angle of the hip. So that's the differentiator between the superficial strategy and then what we would consider this, this deeper shape change that's associated with, with the, the ischium position again under normal circumstances where I still have relative motions available to me. So Austin, I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, obviously I'm going to see you really, really soon and we can talk about it. But if, if it doesn't answer your question, for those of you that are watching on video, then please send a question to askbillhartman at gmail.com and we will clarify for you. Have a great Friday. Have a terrific weekend. Um, the podcast will be up on Sunday, so hopefully you guys are listening to that as well, and I will see you on Monday.